morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning here at Lighthouse Discipleship Center. My name is Dave Everett, and we're going to be continuing our teaching this morning on the four prayers of Paul. And uh, just so you know, all of our teachings are archived on our website at lighthousediscipleship.org, and we're on our YouTube channel, Lighthouse Discipleship Center. Okay, and we also want to say thank you to all those who have partnered with us with your tithes and your offerings. And you can do that through our website at lighthousediscipleship.org. You can go through the gift page to give online. And on the bottom of every page in the footer is our mailing address if you would like to uh, send a check and make payable to Lighthouse Discipleship Center. And again, if you're in the U.S., all of your donations are tax deductible. Okay, we are a 501c3 church. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, like it's, uh, we, uh, let me just also uh, let you know we will have our Bible study tonight at <coughs> 6 o'clock on Effortless Change by Andrew Womack. And again on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock uh, with uh, the Believer's Authority by also Andrew Womack. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into our message again this morning. This is part four on our series on the four prayers of Paul. I thought this would be a short series, but this is actually... Uh, and again, to deeper into these, uh, preparing for these messages, I'm realizing there's a lot more I want to say uh, in regards to these four prayers of Paul. Now, people have asked, even though I have said it, so there's only four prayers of Paul? No, and I've actually said it many times. There's, Paul has prayed more than four times, and more than four times in Scripture. Okay, but there's four prayers that I'm focusing on. I probably should take off the the, the definite article. I probably should call this uh, title, the message, title of this message, Four Prayers of Paul, you know, but I'm, anyway, the title is what it is, and uh, we're talking about four specific prayers. What four prayers are we talking about regarding Paul? And these are the four prayers, two of them are in Ephesians chapter 1 and 3, and then also Philippians and Colossians. Okay, we've already dealt with, in the first two hours of this uh, uh, series, we talked about the two, uh, the prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, Last week and this week, we're going to be talking about the, the, th the, the second prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. And I thought this was going to be just one week on this prayer, but we're actually going to go into three weeks this week and then also next week to conclude this prayer before we go to the latter two prayers in Philippians and Colossians, which we'll deal with in later weeks. Okay, So the, the, this week, we're going to continue on talking about the, the prayer to the Ephesians, the second prayer in this book. Uh, that we are uh, that we are focusing on, and we're talking about specifically this week again the the, the prayer to the Ephesians in cha Ephesians chapter three. So let's read through the prayer real quick, and then we'll recap uh, what we talked about last week, and then we'll get to this week's lesson. <coughs> okay, so Paul's second prayer to the the, the church in Ephesus is for this reason I bow my knees to the Father. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So again we're dealing with these four prayers of Paul. We're specifically dealing with the second prayer of the day on the prayer to the Ephesians uh, in, in, in Ephesians chapter 3. Now last week we started really with this phrase. And the beginning of the prayer, verse 14, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, where Paul says, for this reason. And so I spent the, pretty much the, the entire message last week talking, expounding on this, for this reason. If we're going to, we can study the prayer, and it's powerful, and we will study the prayer. We're going to get into the prayer today. We're not going to finish it. We're going to finish it this week and next week. We're going to take two weeks talking about this prayer. But I spent last week in, in preface to this prayer, talk, uh, expanding on this phrase for this reason. So let me just recap a, a few things, and then we'll get into this week's lesson talking about this prayer. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so 
we talked about how the revelation of God's grace was given to Paul to give to us, okay? We, we went all the way back to the beginning of this chapter, chapter 3, beginning of verse 2. And if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he, God, made known to me, Paul, the mystery as I have briefly written, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known to the sons of man as it has when now. When's now? Now. As it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles' prophets. So my question last week was, what is being revealed now by the Holy Spirit that wasn't revealed in, in, in prior ages? Paul expounds in verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. There's two things that we're, the Holy Spirit is doing to us. That we are part of the same body, the body of Christ, and partakers of his promise where? In Christ. And how are we doing this? Through the gospel. So we expounded a lot on that last week. I'm not going to go into detail on that this week, okay? Believers are not only united to Christ, we are the body of Christ, but believers are also united to one another. So in other words, we expanded last week, and we actually dealt with this from the first prayer of Paul. Now we're dealing with it in the second prayer of Paul. So this is becoming a, this is becoming a point that Paul is making in both. <coughs> excuse me, in both these prayers that we are not only we are not only united to Christ, but we are also united to one another. Okay, we need to understand that. Paul wants us to understand that. Okay, he keeps saying it. So if Paul keeps saying it, I think it behooves us to hear that, okay? There's two things going on here. So as believers, we are a body. We are the body of Christ. This week, we're going to go into a little deeper with this. We're not just a body. We are a family, okay? We're going to get into this in a moment, but this is kind of a precursor to what we're going to get into in this, in this particular uh, prayer. We are not only a body, but we are also a family, Gentiles did not become Jews. That's not, that's not what happened. That's not what Christianity is. No. Jews and Gentiles, not just Gentiles, but Jews and Gentiles, became part of the body of Christ. They became part of the family of God. Okay? Going back to Ephesians chapter 3, real quick. To me, who, who, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles. He's saying the same thing. God gave me this grace so that I can preach it among you. <coughs> and what is he going to preach? The unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul talked about that in Ephesians chapter 1, the first prayer we talked about. The, 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 the riches of Christ. He's talking about it again in this prayer. Paul was given this grace. And I'm going through this a little fast because this is a recap from last week. Okay, And then I'm going to slow down when we get to this week's lesson. Paul was given this grace to preach to us the unsearchable riches of Christ. The mystery God has invested into us is the riches of Christ. Okay? We expounded on that last week. We're going to expound on it even more in the weeks to come. Okay? But let's go back to the, this uh, prelude to this prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. <coughs> Excuse me. And to make all see, he's expounding on what he's supposed to preach to the Gentiles, to us, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages had been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. There's a lot in here, but we have expounded on how God wants everyone to see this mystery. There's a mystery. It was a mystery in the Old Testament. Okay? Uh, before I get there. There, 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 was, there was a mystery in the Old Testament. It's now being revealed in the New Testament. Okay? And we are in the New Testament. Paul was writing the New Testament. He wrote, he wrote two thirds of the New Testament that we all know today. And Paul got to this grace. This covenant was revealed to Paul. It happened to Jesus, but it was preached to Paul. It was preached to the other apostles too. But Paul, who preached a lot of the New Testament that we know today, God wants us to everyone to see this mystery. In the Old Testament, it was concealed. In the New Testament, it is revealed. Okay? The church is part of that mystery. 
It's not the only component of the mystery, but the church was the mystery in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, every detail of this mystery is intended to be fully revealed. It's not a re it's only a it's not it's a mystery to those who are not saved, but it's not a mystery to those it's not supposed to be a mystery to those who are saved. Okay? And so and, and what is this mystery? Well, there's a lot of verses. I, I could do a whole teaching just on this. We could spend hours on this because there's a lot of scripture talking about this mystery. Okay? But one of my famous ones I like to go to is in Colossians 1, the mystery which, was, which, which has been hidden from all ages, that's the Old Testament, and from, generation, and from generations, but now, when's now? Now the New Testament has been re <coughs> Excuse me, has been revealed to his saints. To them, his saints, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. That's the same verbiage he's using in Ephesians chapter uh, 3. The riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This mystery was, was part of it was the church, but what's inside the church? Christ. Okay? The mystery is Christ in you, the church, the hope of glory. Okay? So let's go back to Ephesians chapter 3. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church. To who? We talked about this last week. To the principalities, powers, and heavy places. Paul uses this phrase, principalities, powers, powers in the first prayer in Ephesians chapter 1. He uses it again here before the prayer, second prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, and he will talk about it again in Ephesians chapter 6, which we call the armor of God. He also will mention another passage of scripture, like in Colossians, and we'll get there later. And we talked about it a little bit last week. But we talked about how God has revealed this grace, the revelation of this mystery to the church, and this church, the mystery of Christ in us, the hope of glory, is to be known by the church. And to, and to the principalities, powers, and heavy places. The mystery of the church is to be fully revealed to demonic powers. By who? The church. In the first prayer, Paul said he's put all things underneath his feet. To the church. The church. We are the body of Christ. Jesus is the head. But I don't know about you, but my head is connected to my body. The moment your head becomes disconnected with your body, you are a dead man. Okay? But we are not a dead man. We are alive in Christ. Okay? We're going to get a little deeper with that a little bit today. We're talking about the family. We're talking about, we are the, not only the family, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the building of God. Okay? But Christ, if God has put everything underneath his feet, the, the feet are part of the body. My feet are not connected to my head. They're, they're part of the body, the whole uniform of the body, the whole carcass of the body, if I can, that's connected to the head. But it's all one unit. Okay? He's the head, but we are the body, and, he, and God has put everything underneath his feet, all principalities and powers, all demonic powers, then they are underneath our feet as well. Okay? Christ's church is like a city on a hill. And we talked about this last week, how Jesus said out of Matthew, that you are the light of the world, and you are a city on a hill. Okay? The church is to instruct <coughs> the demonic realm, the manifold wisdom of God. We're supposed, to, we're supposed to preach the gospel to the world, but we are also supposed to instruct the demonic realm, the, uh, the manifold wisdom of God. As we walk in power and victory, Jesus provided... We are to constantly show Satan the wisdom of God. What's the wisdom of God? Well, I'm glad you asked. Corinthians, Paul says in Corinthians, when Jews request a sign and Greeks seek out their wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, are we not Jews and Greeks, the body of Christ? We just, we just established that Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. But to both Jews and Greeks, the church, who are, are believers, not because they're Jews, not because they're Greeks, but if they receive Jesus, whether they be a Jew or whether they be a Gentile, 
the, 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 the wisdom of Christ is the not only the power of God, but Christ is also the wisdom of God. This mystery, Christ in us, the hope of glory, is both the power of God and it's the wisdom of God. And we are to preach that to the world. We are to preach that to the world. But we're also to instruct demonic powers that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ has put all principalities and powers underneath his feet. And because we are the body of Christ, he has put them underneath our feet of Christ. The church is the body of Christ, and Christ has put all principalities and powers underneath his church. Gentiles did not become Jews. Jews and Gentiles became part of the body of Christ. Christ's church is the body of Christ, and the gospel is the wisdom of God. The church is to preach the gospel to Satan, and we need to the revelation knowledge of the Holy Spirit to grasp God's infinite wisdom. We need revelation and understanding, something Paul has been saying throughout both of these prayers, of what we have in Christ. And it takes a divine revelation to understand this, and Paul was praying in both of these prayers that we understand this. Throughout this entire book of Ephesians, you'll see this. This, that Paul is trying to communicate this in Ephesians chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. You'll see this in this book, and especially in these two prayers. Let's go back real quick. Paul's intent was to intend that, that, that now the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church to all principalities and powers in heavenly places. According to the eternal purpose of God, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. We talked the last three weeks about the eternal purpose of God. I can spare a lot of detail with this, but we talked about it, we, we referred to it. <clears throat> and we said this, God is bringing everything together under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He's our King. He's our Lord. Not Satan, and not us. This has always been God's plan and purpose. And those who do not make Jesus preeminent and Lord are entirely out of focus on the eternal purpose of God. Peter, I mean John says it this way, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. But for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he, Jesus, Christ in us, the hope of glory, might destroy the works of the devil. For the church to make known the wisdom of God to all principalities and powers is the eternal purpose of God. We have Christ in us, the hope of glory. And we are to make Christ known to the world. Okay? In other words, we talked about how God's plan of redemption was not an act of thought of man's sins. Christ was slain from the foundation of the world. And God promised eternal life before time even began. And we look at several scriptures like Titus chapter 1 verse 2. And hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised before time began. He also said this in Peter. 1 Peter 1.20 He indeed was ordained for ordained before the foundation world but was manifest in the last times for you. We also saw how in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning before the first prayer, how blessed be the God of our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who has already blessed us in every, with, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him and whom him in love. This whole salvation, this whole eternal purpose of God was not an afterthought. The whole cross, the whole, the, the whole lordship of Jesus Christ of the church was not an afterthought. God had this plan before the foundation of the world. According to the eternal purpose of God, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay? The plan of redemption was God's eternal purpose. And let's, let's finish this uh, intro and uh, recap and then we'll get into today's lesson. Ephesians chapter 3, according to the eternal purpose of God, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence to faith in him. We can approach God, our God with boldness and confidence. But Paul was taking full advantage of his own access to the Father. He's going to talk about the family in just a moment. And we have access to the same Father that Paul, our brother in Christ, had access to. Okay? And he concludes this introduction to this prayer by saying, Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul was in prison when he wrote this. And he did not want them to be focused on his tribulation, 
He wanted them to focus on the revelation of Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. He wanted them to focus on what he was preaching and what he was revealing to them by the grace of God. Paul was so blessed in God's presence, he could not allow others to be bothered by his imprisonment. Paul was so blessed by in God's mystery. He could not allow others to be bothered by his imprisonment. If we appropriate way is ours in Christ, we can overcome any problem on earth just like Paul overcame his problems. Paul's purpose in this prayer that we're going to get start getting into this morning is Paul desired they would not be discouraged because of the things happening to him personally. He follows that desire with a prayer for their strength and fullness in Christ. And so he says, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we spent a lot of time last week talking about this for this reason that we just recap real fast this morning. But we also ended last week talking about how I bow my knees. And I'm not going to go into all that detail again, but I will say this. We are instructed to come and bow to worship our King, our God, our Father. Scripture prophesied how one day every knee will bow to him and confess him as Lord. And Paul, so Paul says, For this reason I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven, and uh, his name, we're going to come to this, the first 15 here in just a moment. But Paul prayed that we would be granted spiritual strength by the Spirit, that we would that he, that, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. We're going we're gonna to capitalize on this in just a moment. Paul also prayed that we would be granted spiritual strength by the spirit. We talked about that. That Christ might make his home or his abode in our hearts by faith. We're going to talk about this this morning. Okay, Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. We're going to capitalize on this this morning. That you being rooted and grounded in love. But the rest of the prayer that we're going to deal with next week, Paul also prayed that through being rooted and grounded in love, we'll talk about a little bit of this this week, we would comprehend to get to, to get revelation knowledge. That's what we've been talking about all four weeks so far, and Paul's been saying in all in both of these prayers, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and, and height. Okay, And he also prayed that we would experience God, Christ's love, we would be filled, uh, as we experience Christ's love, we would be filled with the fullness of God. We're going to talk about that in a lot more detail next week, okay? To know the love of Christ with passive knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So I know I went through that a little fast, so that was recap, so that was a forecast of what's coming up this week uh, and also next week. So let's slow down and let's get into this prayer again. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. Verse 14. We talked about, a lot about this the last week. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's, go, let's add on verse 15. From whom the whole family in heaven and in heaven and earth his name. Okay? Paul spoke of in this in this part of the prayer, verse 15, when he's talking about the whole family in heaven and earth his name, Paul is speaking of those who are saved. He's talking about both Old and New Testament people. He's talking about those who are alive. He's talking about those who are already in heaven. Okay? Remember, this has been a, a key point throughout this whole teaching so far. Jews and Gentiles didn't and be, became part of the Jews and Gentiles together became part of the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. This is the theme that Paul has been saying in both of these prayers so far, and he he he's been calling it the body up to this point. He in this particular part of the prayer, he thought he called it now a family. Okay, so we are as a church, we are. A, a body, but we're also a family. We're going to look at another aspect in just a moment. See, New, New Testament of Scripture describes God as our Father. If He's our Father, then we are a family. Okay? That's how it works. Believers are His children. So we are siblings from a spiritual perspective. I don't know about you, but my brother and I, sometimes we... <clears throat> 
didn't always get along perfectly. We were siblings. That didn't make it right. We loved each other, but we also devoured one another at times, okay? And uh, I'm not saying that in a negative way. I'm just saying we're siblings. And sometimes with us in the church, we don't get along. Okay? And that's one thing Paul is saying pretty pretty hard, uh, pretty firmly in, in all his letters. I mean, there's over 100 scriptures where Paul talks about how we're going to get along with one another. We're children. Okay? We're part of the same body, but we are also part of the same family. God is our Father. We have the same Father, and we are His children. Okay? But he, and, and throughout Scripture, you'll find out he, believers are, are called brethren, our sisters. Okay? Don't get offended, okay? Brethren being mankind. But we are called brethren. And so this whole idea of family is not new to Scripture. Paul kind of uses some words that maybe we, the word family itself, that other, other writers did not necessarily use that terminology. But the terminology is evident in New Testament Scriptures, okay? Paul also says later on in chapter 4, from whom the whole body is fitly joined together and com compacted by which every joint supply is according to the effectual working and the measure of every part making increase of the body until the edifying of itself in love. I don't know about you, I love this scripture and I'm not going to necessarily uh, spend time on this, but some translations talk about how we are knitted together, we are joined together, we are a family, families are knit together. And when someone died, or someone doesn't get along, or someone leaves the family, there's a tearing. Okay? I believe, I believe in the natural family. I believe in, you know, we have our uh, blood-related family, naturally speaking. Well, we have a blood-related family, spiritually speaking. We are united by the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus goes deeper and wider than the, any natural blood. And when there's a tearing in the natural family, it hurts. But when there's a tearing in the spiritual family, it also hurts. And it goes deeper. Okay? Because it, it doesn't just tear the soul. It goes into, it, 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 you know, the spiritual family, it, it, it goes deep. It, 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 uh, there's a, I had a thought there and I just lost it. That's why I'm stumbling for a second, trying to get that thought back. But... You know, the spiritual family, it just, it just goes deeper. Uh, this is not, because Paul also says in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, several verses late, later in the same chapter, how when we don't get along, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we think we grieve the Holy Spirit because we do sin. No, it, 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 we, we grieve the Holy Spirit because we don't get along. And it, it's grieving. It goes deep. It's, it's deeper than the soul. It goes to our spirit, man, spirit, soul, and body. And it we uh, it, it grieves our spirit. Okay, it just goes deeper. I'm not saying a natural family doesn't hurt. It does. But a spiritual family hurts even deeper. Okay, and so, um, I, that's not my teaching this morning, but I just wanted to highlight that because it goes in context. Okay, let's go back to the prayer. For this reason, I now, I bow my knees to, my, to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's our Lord. It's our Father. It's not just mine. It's not just Paul's. It's ours. From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That's why we call ourselves Christians. Okay? We are named. Peter said in Pentecost, be, repent, be baptized into the, the name of Jesus. We are named after him. He's our father. I don't know about you, but I'm named after my father. My last name's Everett because my dad's name, last name is Everett. And I, we can do, go up the genealogy of our family and we can find out where that came from. But I'm named after my father. Well, we're named after Jesus. And we can use the name of Jesus. And we, I, uh, earlier this year, I did a, uh, a teaching on God Revealed, which was the same, seven we did the names of, of God, which I ended on talking about the name of Jesus. We are named, we are in a family, and we are named after Jesus Christ in the Son of Glory. And Paul spoke of, uh, we are already done with this. Uh, okay, so let's move forward. The church is a family. The church is also a body. We've been, we've been dealing with that the last three weeks, but today we're calling it a, also a family. But in talking about the body, in which we have, we have talked, we mentioned this earlier, but let me just go off of this just for a second. Paul, and that's not the only time he's talked about the body, because in Corinthians, 
Paul says, now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. In verse 14, the same chapter, he says, for the body is not one member, but many. Verse 13, I don't know why I'm going backwards, but for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles. We, we tell about how Jew or Gentiles, we are in the body of Christ. Whether we are bond or free, whether we have been, been all made to, to drink in one, one spirit. Jesus also prayed along these lines about, I'm talking about oneness. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the, the, the doctrine of oneness. I'm talking about the, when we are one in him and we are one with another. Okay? Jesus, before he went to the cross, Jesus prayed, I did not pray for these alone. He talked about the 12 disciples. But also for those who will believe in me through their word. Okay? Verse 21, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they all may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Paul is praying in both of these prayers that the body of Christ, the family of God, be united. And Jesus, before he went to the cross, Jesus getting go, ready to go to the cross, he prayed about a number of different things in J John 17. But one of the things that Jesus prayed for is that we, the body of Christ, the believers who would believe because of the apostles' doctrine, which we'll get into that a little, in a little bit, um, that we would be one. Being united and, and the body of Christ is something that not only Paul prayed for, but Jesus prayed for. And why do I spend time on this? Because if Jesus prayed for it, then we need to be we need to pay attention. Is he not your father? Is he not your God? Is he not your Savior and your Lord? Then we need to grow up and get along. Jesus prayed that. Paul prayed that. Okay? We all need to hear that. Amen or oh me. You know? Let's go back to Ephesians. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family... <coughs> Excuse me. And it happened to nurse's name. The church is a body. <coughs> the church is a family. But the church is also a temple. Let's go backwards, Ephesians chapter 2. This is in between the two prayers. Paul said, Now therefore you are no longer strangers, foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles. I just mentioned that a minute ago. And prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Verse 21. In whom the whole building being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. God's not just doing something in you. God's not just building something in you. God is building something in us. Don't make this just between you and God. It starts there. But we are a body, we are a family, we are the household of God, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The church is the body of Christ, the church is the household of God. And the household of God is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Okay? Paul got this, great, this gospel through this grace of God to reveal it to us, so did the other apostles and prophets. Okay, I'm talking about new. Anyway, uh, I'll leave that back. The early church. Let's go to Acts chapter two real quick. And they, the early church, the first, the, the first believers, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. These four, these four things are our core teachings in this church. If you go to our website, I have a page called Core Teachings under Resources, and I highlight on almost every page. I, I will talk about our mission and our values. I have these four teachings. I did a teaching a, a few years ago on how we are to be steadfast 
and an apostle's doctrine. Uh, we are to be steadfast in the fellowship. Uh, we are to be steadfast in the breaking of bread, which it, teach, it speaks of covenant. Not only covenant with God, but covenant with one another. And also, uh, we are to be steadfast in prayers. Okay? I don't know about you, but it starts with apostle's doctrine first. But this is talking about the church. This is talking about the church. This is talking about the church being together, doing it together. They didn't just pray individually in their prayer closet. They did that, but they prayed together. They were united. They were the church. Okay? <coughs> and so, and they didn't just fellowship. They didn't just be the church. They also sat on their doctrine. They were disciples. Okay? And they were steadfast. And the church did it daily. We do it once a week, twice a week, at most, for most of us. Some of us don't even do it that much. Some of us just pop in whenever we want to. Okay? They were steadfast, and they did it daily. We don't. And we wonder why we're not experiencing what the early church did. And yet we were, we're not steadfast like they were. Okay? Amen or amen. The revelation of God's grace was given to Paul to give to us. We have established this throughout this teaching, especially in this prayer. What is, what is being revealed now by the Holy Spirit? Believers are also united to one another. We are a family of God. We are the people of God. So, again, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father, my Lord Jesus Christ, in whom the whole building being fit. I don't know. I'm bouncing around here a little bit on my notes. But just, I guess we're going back here to, to Ephesians chapter 2. And so the whole building being fit together grows into a holy temple. We are a family. I'll go back here real quick. We are a family. We, we are also a temple. We are also the house of God. And we are, we are a building. We are the building of God being fit together grow, and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom also you are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the hand of spirit. Christ is the cornerstone. We even sang about that this morning in one of our worship songs. But on Christ, every structure is aligned perfectly. When we are in Christ, when Christ is the cornerstone, when Christ is the cornerstone of our teachings, when Christ is the cornerstone of our conversation, you know, there's a lot of people who preach, who preach and teach, but they don't mention Christ at all. I have no desire or appetite to sit under a pastor or teacher who doesn't even mention our our head, our father, our, our, our cornerstone. Because once you, once you remove the cornerstone, the whole building falls apart. There is no foundation. Okay? Now, it's not, but once we have the structure, we can, what do you do with the house? You don't just have a house so you can have a building. You have a, a, you have a dwelling place. For God to dwell, for the people to dwell, for people to come together. And when Christ is, is part of the structure, he's the cornerstone, everything is aligned perfectly. And as believers, we are carefully joined together. Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 4. He says it here in Ephesians chapter 2. And, and there's other scriptures I can talk about how we are carefully joined together as a body. You know, when you think of our human body, our, the best scientists in the world could not have designed this body. I know they're trying to clone it and do different things, but they're trying to repeat what the master creator already created. Okay, we have been, even Jeremiah praised how we were, 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 were I think it's Jeremiah or even David talked about how we are knit together in our mother's womb. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay, as believers, we are carefully joined. And as believers, we are constantly grow, a grow, we are constantly a growing temple. I didn't call it that. Paul called it that in Ephesians chapter two. And this growing temple is inhabited by God. We are a dwelling place for God. Now that doesn't get you excited. Your wood is wet. Okay, Jews and Gentiles are now an ever growing structure indwelt by God. That is awesome. See, the church building is not the house of God. Believers are the house of God. COVID, persecution, can say that we can't meet in a church building. 
I believe in assembling together. I believe in having a church building. But if the government tells me I can't have a church building, what did it really do to me? Because we are the temple of God. The thing I like about that, we can take the temple of God anywhere. They put us in jail. We just took the temple of God in jail. Wherever we go, no matter what we do, the, the, it goes with us. Because why? Christ is in us. The hope of glory. Isn't it awesome? This is awesome. No matter where you put me, even if you put me on the island of Patmos like John, then you just take the temple there. Okay? In whom the whole body building being fit together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Let's go back to the prayer real quick. From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Verse 16. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. There's a lot here. We're going to break this apart. Paul's prayer is a message in itself on how to walk in the fullness of God. This prayer. That's why it takes me three weeks to go through this prayer and really just two in this prayer specifically. Okay. Paul prayed we would be granted spiritual strength by the Spirit. He also prayed that as believers we will be strengthened through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's just dive into this. Well-meaning Christians are living far short of what God wants them to do or be. And many well-meaning Christians are living far short of what they want for themselves. Many well-meaning Christians are living far short what God wants them to be. <coughs> and many well-meaning Christians are not satisfied where they want to be themselves. Is that not true? If you, I mean, most of us are discontent with where we are, and we know we're living far, when we look at our lives, and our church, our gatherings, it just seems to fall short of the early church and the Word of God. And most of us. I'm not saying all of us, but most of us. And I'm talking about well-meaning Christians. I'm not talking about flicks. I'm talking about many well-meaning Christians, including, I'm talking about myself here. I'm not satisfied where I am at in many levels. Okay? But I'm not going to beat myself up over it, but I'm not satisfied. I'm moving forward by the grace of God. I want more. I want to experience heaven on earth. I want all God has for me. And as a pastor, I want all that God has for you. And that's what Paul's praying here. Paul wants you to walk into the fullness of God. This is not to get on your case. This is not to inspire you, to motivate you, to charge you, to implore you. Why is this true? Why are we living so low? under what God has provided for us in Christ by the Holy Spirit. Because many, well, many Christians are trying to live for God. Instead of God living through them. Many, well, meaning Christians are trying to live for God instead of letting God live through them. That's a world of difference between the two. One is called religion, and the other is called Christianity. Christianity does not work if you try to live for God. Christianity works if you let God live for you through you. If you try to live holy and righteous without God living in and through you, you will fail. If you try to preach the gospel without God living through you by the Spirit, you will fail. But Christianity is not you living for God. It's God living through you. Big difference. One is called religion, and the other is called true Christianity. Or the Spirit-filled life. We are the body of Christ. We are not the body absent of Christ. 
Are you getting this? This is not just a cliche. This is not just a phrase. This is not just Christian jargon. This is who we are. Most of us need a revelation who we are. This is our identity. Okay? Christ is the head. That's why we spend so much time on this. And we are the family of God. Okay, let me go back here. We are the body of Christ, where Christ is the head. We are the family of God, where God is our Father. The church is the household of God. And He is our cornerstone. Okay? He has built us in such a way so that we can be the temple of the Holy Spirit, where God lives and where God dwells. Let's go back here. That He would grant you according to the riches of His glory. It is rich. To be strengthened with might through <coughs> His Spirit and that man. Stop trying to live for God and allow His Spirit to live through you. The mystery of the gospel, the mystery of the kingdom is a seed. The mystery of the gospel, the mystery of the kingdom is Christ in you. Christ, the seed, is in you. And in that seed, in Christ, the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of the kingdom is that you are born of God. You are not born a man. Your DNA, your seed, your nature, the glory that's in you is Christ. And his life is flowing through your veins. Medically speaking, the life is in the blood. The Bible says that too. Without blood, you don't have any life. And if his life is flowing through your veins. In that life is the seed, his nature, the nature of God, the spirit of God, by which we are born. Folks, this is the highlight of my teaching this morning. The key to Christian living is trusting God. The key to Christian living is depending on God. The just lives by his faith. The key to Christian living is resting in God. The key to all victory is depending on the spirit of the living God. And where is he? In you. Where's the kingdom? In you. Where's the mystery? It's in you. Where's Christ? In you. Where's the spirit of God? He's in you. Let him not just be in you. Let him flow through you. Stop living for God and let him who is in you live through you. His body. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Christ in you the whole glory. To be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Paul said it this way, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul also said at 2 Corinthians 3.18, the last verse of chapter 3, but we all with an unveiled face beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. This is one of my favorite verses uh, back in 2009-ish. I remember I was reading this in the context that surrounded this. And I was reading this and God asked me, when you look in the mirror, Dave, who do you see? I don't know about you, but I, I was going to get my little mirror out, but I didn't. But anyway... When, I don't know about you, when you look into a mirror, pretend my hand is a mirror. When I look into a mirror, I see my own reflection. That's how a mirror works. A mirror is not a glass window where I can see through it. A mirror is a reflective device. And you can see, what, the mirror will reflect whatever is looking at it. And I said, 
He asked me, when you look in the mirror, who do you see? I don't know about you, but when I look in the mirror, I always, I always show up. I'm always there. That's just how a mirror works. But the scripture says, I'm not going to deal with the first part of this. This is a whole other teaching. He deals with this, and, and if you want to know how to deal with this, this is verses 14 to 16. He's talk, a veiled face is, I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but I'm talking about it. But a veiled face is, our, our, our vision, our, our minds are blinded by the law. That's religion. Paul deals with that in, in, in chapter 3. Specifically chapter 14, he specifically says that in, in, in connection with what he said pr prior to that in the same chapter. And he says the only way to remove this veil, veil is to preach Christ. He says that in verse 15 and 16. Okay? He says when we're beholding, the word behold means to see with the mind. That's what the word means. Behold. See, see with the mind. That's what the word behold. I mean, of our mind has eyes. Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1 that I prayed that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. Beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord. You know, when God asked me, Dave, when you look in the mirror, who do you see? And I said, Dave. When God asked me the same question again, I knew I had, I had answered the question wrong. God wasn't getting on my case. He wasn't belittling me. But I, he asked me a question. I answered it. So he asked me the same question again. This was a major turning point for me in my life when I got this. Because when I read this verse, I, sometimes we just glance over a verse and we don't get the meaning of it. It says, when you behold as in the mirror the glory of the Lord. The Bible says, I think, I think it's in James, where the word of God is like a mirror. And when we behold God, the word of God, the living word of God, as in the mirror, we are not supposed to see us. But we are supposed to see him. Again, I hope you get this. But we all, with an unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord. When you look into the mirror of God's word, you are not beholding you. You are beholding him. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. When you look at your life, you need to stop seeing you. You died. You were crucified with Christ. Romans chapter 6. Galatians chapter 2. You died. You were crucified with Christ. And it's no longer you who live, but it's Christ who lives in you. And when you look into the mirror of God's word, it's not you. You are born again. You are born of God. And when you, when you behold God, Christ, His glory, in the mirror of Christ, and you the hope of glory, you will be transformed into the same image. What image? The one that you're beholding. When you behold Christ, you will be transformed into the image that you're beholding from glory to glory. What does that mean? He talked about, if you read Ephesians chapter 3, he talked about how the law was the glory of the Old Testament. He talked about how and the glory of the Old Testament was he called the law the, 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 he, called the, the, he called the law the ministry of death and he called the law the ministry of condemnation and then he compares it to the law he, he compares it to the New Testament which is the, the ministry of righteousness and the ministry of the spirit the ministry of the spirit and the ministry of righteousness is the same thing Chapter 5, he will call it the ministry of reconciliation. I will deal with that in my next teaching series. I'm going to talk about being established in righteousness. I, I will spend a whole hour on that. Maybe even more. Okay? But at the same point in time, when we, when we behold his glory in the mirror, we are being transformed. That's where we get the word metamorphosis. Like a, a, caterp a caterpillar being transformed into a butterfly or a tadpole into a frog, you're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. I'm not going to spend more time on this. I spent a lot of time on this. My point I'm trying to make it is that, let me just go back here real quick, that we realize it's Christ who lives in us. Okay? We go back even, uh, the, 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 the key to victorious living is that we are depending on God. That we realize that we have a revelation. It's Christ who lives in us. Okay, let me go back from where we were. Okay? With that in mind, those who are not born again can never be victorious. 
God is not dwelling in them. And some people who are born again, God is dwelling in them, but they don't know it. They don't live their life like that is true. They live like they were born again so they can go to heaven, but now they're living their own life on their own strength. And so they are defeated. They, are, they don't know why it's not working. They're not victorious. Because they're, just, they're trying to do it, and not God who is in them doing it. Big difference. See, even Christians will not experience the victory apart from depending on the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of God. You cannot, you, 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 if you are, Paul said it this way in Romans, anything that's not a faith is sin. If you are doing anything for God or by God, and you are depending on you and not God, according to Paul, that's sin. And this is not to get on your case. This is, Christianity is not a self-help program. Christianity is a divine intervention where God becomes king and lord of your life. He lives his life in and through you. And all the power of the believer originates from the Holy Spirit, from the Spirit of God. So when Paul prays that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in your inner man. Let's talk about the strength of the believer real quick. The strength. Strengthening of the believer is not done in our spirit, man. See, our born-again spirits are perfect in Christ. He says in Corinthians, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So the strength of the believer is not our, our, our spirit, is not done in our spirit, for our born again spirits are perfect in Christ. Our spirits are not the problem. Okay? Jesus said it this way watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, our born again spirits. We teach this in more detail when we talk about spirit, soul, and body. I'm trying to make it short, but I think I'm making it complicated. I'm not trying to do that. See, we have a spirit. When we are a spirit. We have a soul, and we live in a body. And we're going to talk about that in a lot more detail uh, in our other teachings. When we talk about it in more detail, when we talk about spirit, soul, and body. When you became born again, your spirit is just like Christ. Your body, your mind needs to be renewed. And your body... And you'll get a new body when Jesus comes. But when you are born again, we receive a new spirit at conversion. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. What, what happened? Did you get a new body? No. Did you get a new mind, a new, a new soul? No. But you got a new spirit. And when, when you read verses like this, if you don't understand spirit, soul, and body, verses like this will be confusing to you. Because you look, you look in the mirror and you see the same, you see the same day that you always saw before. Because we're not being, we're beholding, we're not beholding His glory. We're beholding our old flesh. Okay. But not only did we receive a new spirit at conversion, but it's like Jesus. John said it this way: that Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness and day of judgment. Because as He is, so are we in this world. As He is. How's Jesus? Is Jesus living in sin? No. Is Jesus sick? No. Is Jesus suffering? No. But just as he is, he's talking about our born again spirits, so are we in this world. Are we perfect in the flesh? No. In Christ? Yes. Our born again spirits are like he is in this world. Okay? Romans 8 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Okay? When you, we're not talking about right here, we're not talking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, but when you, when you are born again, your spirit is born again. You're not in the flesh anymore. Even Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, we know no man after the flesh, even Christ. We are born again. We're not in the flesh, we are in the Spirit. Okay? Paul said this in Galatians. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Your spirit is born again. Okay? 
So our born again spirits, we receive a new spirit of conversion when we, and that's just like Jesus. And our born again spirits are always going to do God's will. Your flesh is not. <laughs> your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Okay? <clears throat> but your born again spirit is always going to do God's will. That's why praying in the spirit is so powerful. Because you can pray for prayers. It's not you praying, but it's the spirit in you praying. Okay? Our flesh is... It, uh, 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 so in other words, our spirits are not the problem. Our flesh is the problem. What's our flesh? Our flesh includes our physical bodies, our souls, which is our mind, will, and emotions. Okay, This is not a whole teaching of spirit, soul, and body. I'm trying to make it simple and short, sweet right now. I hope I'm not making this confusing. In other words, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What's the earthen vessel? This, this body. This body is an earthen vessel. And in this earthen vessel, we have a treasure. That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. In, in this earthen vessel, in these jars of clay, God has deposited his spirit, a treasure, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Okay? And God has given every believer everything it takes to walk in victory. It's a treasure. It's, and those of us who don't know it, it's a mystery. The world can't take, the world didn't give it to us, and the world can't take it away. Our spirits, where God has deposited all his power and glory, is inside our flesh. I know that sounds confusing to some people don't understand what I'm talking about. Okay? In these earthen vessels, God has deposited all of his power and glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Our, what's deposited is our born-again spirits who are just like God. Peter, Jim, <coughs> Peter says it this way, you're not born again of corruptible seed, but an incorruptible seed. Inside these jars of clay, God has deposited the seed of Christ. It's in seed form. And it's on the inside of this flesh. But we have this treasure in first and best that the excellence of the power may be in God and not of us. So let's talk about experiencing this divine flow real quick. As we renew our minds, in Romans 12, 12, 2, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And we begin to act on the word of God. Because he says that we would be granted according to the riches of glory to be strengthened with might through the, the spirit and inner man. Um, sorry, I thought I had another point here. Let's just keep it with this. I say a lot of different things. I don't know if I'm being confused. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm running out of time, but I'm also, I'm also, uh, uh trying to make this clear. Paul has been praying something and, and, and everything we've been teaching so far in this series. Christ in us, the hope of glory. I talked a lot about how we're a family, we're together, but there's, a, there's something that Paul wants us to understand. There's something that Paul wants us to get a revelation of. Part of it was already just said, that we are known we, who we are in Christ, that we are the body of Christ, we are united, and we are in Christ. But God has deposited himself, his spirit, we're going to get into this prayer next week. But God has put into us the fullness of God. And how do we experience... I just mentioned how spirit, soul, and body, our spirit is born again, but our mind, our soul, and our, and our bodies are not born again. And we are transformed by the reunion of our mind, Romans chapter 12. How do we experience the divine flow can I mention how we're not to live for God, we're supposed to let God flow through us. How do we experience this divine flow? We renew our minds to who we are in Christ. We are transformed by beholding His glory and not our glory. We are transformed by the renewing of our mind. We need to reprogram, renew our mind. That word renew in the Greek means to renovate. We need to renovate our mind. And then we need to begin to act on the word of God. If the Bible says you're a child of God, then you need to act like a child of God. The strength, the power of it is not because you are acting. You're not just acting on your own, you're acting on the word of God. James says, 
And that's where James 20 says, faith without works is death. We're not just, we're not doing an act without God. We are renewing our minds to who we are. And then we're acting like who we are. In other words, if I'm a child of God, then I need to live like a child of God. How do I do that? I allow Him to live through me. That's what I renew in my mind. I renew my mind, not, not, I'm not just renewing my mind that I'm a child of God. I'm also renewing my mind that Christ is in me. I renew my mind that I'm born of God. I renew my mind that Christ is in me. His fullness is in me. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. I'm renewing my mind. I'm beholding His glory as in the mirror. I'm beholding that it's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives. I'm beholding that I'm the temple of God. I'm the family of God. I'm the body of God. I'm full of God. And God is living through me. I renew my mind to that. And then I'm letting God act through me. And live through me. I'm co cooperating. I'm yielding to the Spirit of God. That's, that's the act. I'm not doing this. I, I'm not trying to make the Word of God true. I'm letting the Word of God, who's a person who's living inside me, live His life through me. But I have to. I can quench the Holy Spirit. I can do it my own way. I can do it without depending on God. Or as I renew my mind, I can depend on God and do it. I don't know if you're getting all that. Let's go, let's go forward. That he would grant you according to the switching of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit and the inner man. Just as our physical muscles must be used to increase strength, our flesh must be exercised to God. Yes. Paul said this in Timothy. <coughs> but reject profane and all wise fables and exercise yourselves towards godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little. <laughs> okay? That's my emphasis. But godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. So, the, 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 you know, there's a lot being said here. I don't have time to spend a lot of time on this. But sometimes we need to, we are godly in Christ Jesus, but we need to start practicing. We need to start exercising that. We need to start exercising who we are. But godliness is profitable to all things. Anyway, let's move forward. That he would grant you according to the riches of glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit and in and man. See, Paul prayed that we would be granted spiritual strength by the spirit. That as believers, we would be strengthened through the power of the Holy Spirit. Two thoughts are almost the same, but there's two ways of expressing it. Paul prayed, and I'm hoping, I, I feel like I've gotten too deep in some areas that I've lost some of you. But I want to steer this back in. If that's the case. Paul prayed we would be granted spiritual strength by the Spirit. This whole life, this whole godliness that we're supposed to live out is by the strength of the Holy Spirit. Okay? He also prayed that as believers we would be strengthened through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's almost the same thing, just two different ways of saying it. But Paul also prayed that Christ may make his home or his abode in our hearts by faith. Okay? So let's go to verse 17 real quick. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. There's a lot here in this little verse here. Don't lose me here. I know we're, we're, around, we're around the third base here, but I got a lot to say between third base and home. Okay? Christ indwells in every believer at the moment of salvation. The moment you became born again, Christ indwells inside of you. Right? Can we all agree with that? Okay? Romans 8 9 says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And indeed, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he is not of his. So the moment you became born again, God, the Spirit of Christ, began to dwell on the inside of you. Okay? But Paul said, prayed that Christ may dwell in you. We already read how, how Christ already dwells in us. Romans chapter 8. But Paul prayed that Christ may dwell in your heart. Well, which is it? Is he already dwelling in us? If, if Christ is already dwelling in us, why did he pray that God may dwell in us? Why did Paul pray this? Are you following me so far? Okay, I don't know about you, but that's a legitimate question. And if we don't answer some questions, we're going to get me messed up in our theology. Okay? Paul prayed that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Okay? 
that you're being rooted and grounded in love. See, in the, in the previous verse, he talked about the inner man, but here he calls it the heart. Let's look at this real quick so we can understand the question. Let's look at the heart of the inner man. See, the heart, the inner man, is comprised of the soul and the spirit. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, he calls it the inner man. Okay, verse 17, he calls it the heart. Okay? So the heart, is, the inner man, it comprises of the soul and the spirit. We'll, we'll, we'll look at it in that a little deeper. But the spirit is definitely a part of the heart. It's not just the, the heart is not just the soul, but, but it's also the spirit. Okay? We'll get into some scriptures in just a second here. In Romans 2.29, Paul says, but he as a Jew who is one innerly and circumcised is that of the heart, in the spirit, not the, not the letter, whose praise is not from man, but from God. He also says in 2 Corinthians 1.22, who also has sealed us and given us a spirit in our heart. I'm giving you multiple verses talking about how the spirit and the heart are connected. Okay? Galatians 4.6 says, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit into his sons into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Peter says, rather let it be hidden person, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of the gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So when we're talking about the heart, the inner man, that we're supposed to be strengthened by the Spirit of God, the, the, the heart comprises both the soul and the spirit. I'll deal with the soul in just a moment, but the spirit is definitely part of the heart. Okay? Our spirits are only part of our heart. Because we also have the soul part of it as well. Okay? For example, for example, sin, iniquity, unbelief also come from the heart. But they don't come from our born again spirits. And because all of this is and this is probably sounding confusing to a lot of you, because to most of us it is confusing. It's hard to divide between the soul and the spirit. <coughs> That's why the writer of Hebrews says, for the word of God is a living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the division of the soul and the spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and in the center of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It takes the word of God, the spirit of truth, to even discern or divide the soul and the spirit. They're so knit together that the word of God can make a distinction where flesh can't. That makes sense. We're supposed to be strengthened in our inner man. We're talking about the heart. There's something that God wants, Paul's praying that God would do in our hearts, in our inner man. And <coughs> I'm giving you a lot of spirit language. I'm giving you a lot of soul language. And which is it? How do you do this? And, and the only way you can even know the difference between the two is... The word of God can only is the only source that can divide the difference between is a two-edged sword that can it's the only instrument, it's the only tool, it's the only way that you can divide the two apart. There's the only way you can distinct make a distinction between the two. Otherwise, they are closely, they're very closely knit together. Because the heart it's comprised of soul and spirit. It, the spirit is definitely part of the heart. And our spirits are only a part of the heart because we got the soul out of it too. But even sin, iniquity, and unbelief come from the heart too. Okay? We are to believe with all of our hearts. For example, uh, Philip said in Acts chapter 8, he said to the Ethiopian, he said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. You may. And he answered and said, I do believe. See, the heart, we believe with all of our hearts. <coughs> we, are, we don't have the singleness of heart. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, Servants obey in all things, your masters according to the flesh, not with, the, the, with eye service as men pleasers, but in the singleness of heart. Okay, I'm going through this a little fast because I'm running out of time, but I, I, I want to just continue with this just for a moment, okay? I said, I'm throwing, like a lawyer, I'm throwing a lot of things out, and I'm going to hopefully define this and make it simple here in just a moment, okay? Bear with me. So with the heart, we're talking about we're to believe with the heart. We're supposed to have singles with the heart. In other words, our hearts have two minds. They have two ways of thinking. We have the flesh, and we have the spirit. We have our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, the flesh, and we have our spirit that knows all things. 
James says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You double-minded. Okay? See, when we're born again, the instant we believe on Jesus, we believe him with our hearts. You believe with your hearts, confess your mouth, and you will be saved. Romans chapter 10. Okay? But, and God sends his spirit into it. He uh, sends the spirit of his son. Galatians 4, 6. And where does he send them? Into our hearts. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So when we become born again, the instant we believe in Jesus with our heart, God sends us his spirit into our hearts. Okay? And we have to believe with all of our hearts, spirit, and soul, okay, to see and feel the results in our bodies. I'm saying a lot of different things. I'm hoping I'm making sense here. And when Paul prays that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, Paul prayed that the presence of Christ, which is already a reality in your spirit when you were born again, will become a reality in your souls, your, your, your mind, world, emotions. This is part of the simplicity that I want to talk about. I said a lot of different things in the last few minutes. Paul is praying that the presence of Christ, who is already in existence, already a reality in your born-again spirit, will become a reality in your soul, in your mind, as you renew your mind to who you are. So that you won't be double-minded, you will be single-minded. And only the Word of God can divide the soul and the spirit. This is deep, but I, 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 oh by the grace of God you get this. Paul said, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? It's only as you transform your mind, renew your mind, that you can be transformed to prove and to know what is a perfect will of God. Not only in your life, but in all things. Am I making sense this morning? Paul prayed that the presence of Christ, which is already a reality in our spirits, to become a reality in our souls, the renewing of our minds. Folks, Everything I just said in the last several moments is a matter of faith. We don't do this in the flesh. We do this by faith. Because Paul prayed that Christ may dwell in your hearts. He's already there. But we need to do this through faith. We're going to get to this last part in just a moment. Okay? Most people don't like doing anything by faith. Most people want to see it or feel it. Okay. But the results of faith will sometimes produce feelings. The byproduct of faith will, will be sometimes something you can feel. And sometimes the results of faith will be something you can see. But it doesn't start there. It starts by faith. You can't get the fruit of faith you can't get the fruit, the results of faith, until you first have faith. Am I making sense? Seeing is not faith. Feelings are not faith. Okay? They're polar opposites. But if you have faith, you can, sometimes can see or feel the results of it. For example, here's some prayers of unbelief that people sometimes pray all the time. They pray, Lord, please be with us today. I want to pray, Lord, please go with us. Or Lord, we invite you here. Or Lord, we welcome you here. I don't like these prayers because they're unbelief. Why do I not like these prayers? Or even this one, don't, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from us, from uh, Psalm 50, uh, 51. That, is a, that was a perfect prayer for David in the Old Testament. But did not God say, for he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. If God says he will never leave us or forsake us, then why are we inviting him here? here? He's already here. That's not faith. When you think that God has left, that's not faith. Where does faith come from? The word of God. The word of God says he will never leave you or forsake you. If, if you feel like God left you or forsake you, he's not the one who left. You did. Okay? Did God, is God, is he a God? He should lie. 
Let God be true and not be made a liar. I understand the intent of that prayer. It sounds good. It sounds right. But it's unbelief. And I'm not focusing on that so much. I'm just trying to make an example of being transformed by the renewing of our minds. We need to get our knowledge from the Word of God and pray according to what the Word of God says. We need to live by faith. See, any prayer that assumes God is absent or needs to come or remain is wrong. I want to pray prayers that are full of faith. And this is one example. I'm not picking on anybody or anything. I'm just using an example. I pray these prayers. There's songs that some of us sing that invite God to come. Like he left. They're inviting God like he's never been there before. Now I can understand if the connotation is, Lord, I'm focusing on you. Because chances are you weren't focusing on him before. <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, somebody could be in the room, you know, even though they're there, but you're not focused on them. I can understand that. Because then you're talking about you changing, not God. Okay? Anyway. <clears throat> I'm trying to bring this in, into all, all this together here. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through the spirit of the man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. We've hit a lot of things. I don't know if I'm making, making sense with all this this morning. I'm trying. Paul prayed that instead of us being dominated by our feelings, but by, by, instead of us being dominated by our feelings, feelings by faith we would I didn't write out my whole thought there. Let's go with the second one here. Paul prayed that being strengthened in our inner man that the fullness of Christ may dwell in our hearts. Okay. Paul wants us to live by faith, not by sight. God want, Paul wants us to be strengthened in our inner man by faith. How many of you know that it's going to be hard, it's going to be hard to be strengthened in your inner man? If you're focused on the circumstances, if you're focused on what you can see, if you're focused on what you can feel, because how many of you know sometimes what you see and what you feel emotionally, physically, spiritually may not always be what God wants, what God has promised. And you're going to have to see it by faith. You're going to have to hear it by faith before you see it in the flesh and if you are focused on what you feel and what you are uh, what you see your faith is not going to be strengthened it's going to be weakened you no matter what's going on all hell can be breaking loose but you can be strengthened in your inner man if you are focused on what God said who you are in Christ Paul was in prison. They were disturbed because Paul, their leader, was in prison. And he didn't want them to be focused on what they were feeling and what they were seeing, but by the word of God, who they were in Christ. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom the whole family on earth is named. Okay? That Christ, he prayed that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, not by their circumstances. Okay? He's already there. But you need a, he's already there, but it becomes a reality in your flesh when you see it in your inner man, when you're strengthened. You're going to see the results of it. You, you need to behold the reality, that even though he's already there. But then there's this last phrase. And we're going, to, I guess we're going to really spend more time on this next week, but I want to end it here. I'm over time, but I'm going to want to at least touch on it, and then we'll go into this next week. That you being rooted and grounded in love. Paul did not describe a casual acquaintance with God's love. Paul described an intimate understanding and experiential knowledge of the depths of God's love. That's, those are some deep words. And we're going to come back to this next week and we'll look at this a little more. But Paul described not just a casual acquaintance with God's love, but an intimate understanding 
and an experiential knowledge of the depths of God's love. Just as a tree, a tree's roots provide it with stability and nourishment. God's love, and we'll come back to this all next week, God's love is the foundation on which everything else we receive from God is built. That's why faith that we just talked about works by love. Okay? What I'm describing right now is, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family of earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit and inner man, that Christ may grow in your hearts, that you're being rooted and grounded in love. There's this hyphen here. Verse 18 is going to be uh, in between the hyphens, and then we're going to go to verse 19. 17 can almost go straight into verse 19, but he has basically a parenthetical phrase in between here, what we call hyphens. He's emphasizing something. He's emphasizing this being rooted and grounded in love before he gets into really talking about the depths of that love. There's something that Paul is saying once we he's established who we are in Christ, but there's something that Paul wants us to be rooted and grounded in. Because when we're rooted and grounded in love, his love becomes a foundation for our faith. For God, for, so that we, that Christ can dwell. See, if we are still, if we don't know God's love, if we're not rooted and grounded in God's love, Christ might be dwelling in us. But we, because we don't feel it, because we don't see it, we don't have faith in it. And we are not strengthened. We are weakened. And we are falling apart, wanting what God is when He was there all the time. And so there's something that we need to be, just like the root systems, give not only stability and nourishment to that tree, so we need to be rooted, stability, and grounded, not only for stability, but also for nourishment to our faith, so that we can walk in faith and not by sight. Knowing that God dwells in us, not just us personally, but us, the church. We're talking about Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to finish this prayer, hopefully next week. I'm not racing through this. And then we'll get to the remaining prayers of Paul that we'll be highlighting in this series. This is deep. I'm hoping I'm making sense in this. I want you to get Paul's heart. I'm saying a lot of different things. I have a lot of rabbit trails I could go and I'll teach a whole other series of messages on. I'm trying to compile this together. Okay, I'm trying to make it simple. And then, uh, and then we're, we're talking about the four prayers of Paul. Awesome. I went over time. Thank you for your patience. I went about 15 minutes over. But anyway, we'll see you next. And we'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock. We'll talk about evolution change. God bless you guys. I appreciate that extra 15.